Thank you. Working? Okay, uh, I'm Chris Benson, Deep Learning with Go. Uh, quick thing about me, uh, I do AI and machine learning as a strategist, and I do architecture for deep learning. Uh, I'm the organizer of Atlanta's deep learning uh, meetup, which is actually one of the largest in the world. So we have over 900 members, and we're growing. We've only been going for six months, um, and we have 60 plus people that, uh, that come. Georgia Tech is there, which is a big AI school, and uh, it's really driven that going forward. Been a gopher for about three years now, developer for about 20 something, 25. <laughs> Uh, introduced to deep learning in 1992, before it was called that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, last year, did the Stanford University Machine Learning Certificate on Coursera, and uh, there is a, uh, a particular technical publisher uh, based in Birmingham that I'm having discussions with, maybe about a video and, and book series, but that's not locked down yet. Um, because we're in London, in the UK, my wife and daughter are British. I'm obviously American, but you know that's that that's my legit thing right there. So. Uh, oh, and that was, that was Harry Potter, if you didn't recognize it, here in London uh, last year. Um, so about 25 years ago, I was a college student um, way back and uh, got int an interesting introduction to deep learning at the time before it was called that. And so this is an uh, airplane called the F-22. Uh, it is uh, currently the top air-to-air -air, uh, fighter in the world. Um, that may change at some point in the future, but it's pretty amazing. I've seen it in person a number of times. It was made in the Lockheed plant near Atlanta, and um, it had an interesting beginning because there was a point when it was still a prototype, and there were two of them in the world at the time, called the YF-22, and it had a crash landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California when they were doing test flights. It was April 1992 and it was due to this avionics error, and it was supposed to prevent this pilot-induced oscillation. So the, the test pilot's trying to crash the plane, and the avionics software is there to prevent it from being possible. Well, this very grainy video, it didn't work out so way. Uh, so he hits the runway, and a fire erupts out the back, and he goes sk skidding for thousands of feet down the runway, and um, so suddenly the leadership of Lockheed goes, this is really bad. And the United States Air Force goes, this is really bad. Um, and so they were trying to figure out how are they going to handle this. Well, the problem was assigned to this man uh, who was a uh, veteran Lockheed engineer. Uh, he had really focused on new technologies, trying to solve some of the really complicated AI-based uh, issues that the avionics had involved and stuff. And he uh, would apply these different things. And one of the things he did was he got into what was, what would eventually be called deep learning. It was called neural networks at the time. Very bleeding edge stuff. He happens to be my father. So the interesting thing was, I didn't particularly have an interest, but dad was really struggling with this. And he'd come home, and for six months to a year, this was our dinner table talk about you know, how you solve this and what he had tried and all this stuff. And so. Um, it invested in me a lifelong interest in this topic. Uh, and I went away for it, from it for many years, but eventually came back. And so I owe it to my father that I'm actually standing here today with an interest in this topic. Um, things come around. So it begs the question, what is deep learning? And I want to hit it at several layers as we go forward. Um, the very first answer is the cocktail party answer. It's the easy, high fluffy stuff that you can talk about. Um, no, this is probably not the kind of deep learning that we're talking about. It might have been what people were calling deep learning a few years back. And though the next one makes me feel very relaxed, this is also not the kind of deep learning that we're going for today. What deep learning is, is it's modern artificial intelligence that's working today. This is no longer in the future kind of stuff. Deep learning is an approach to machine learning, and it is the thing that is driving the current AI revolution. And, and you, can, you can feel it so, month by month as it's coming on. Last year, it was touching the, the mainstream media somewhat, um, here and there, and the technical news was all about it. And these days, you can't get on BBC and CNN you know, on any given day without having AI, machine learning, deep learning stories hitting, and it's just going everywhere. It's become a huge thing, um, and it wouldn't be such a huge thing uh, if it didn't at least in part work at this point. There's, a, there's a, also a lot of hype. We'll get around, we'll talk about that as well as we go forward. But uh, the fundamentals are there. So 
this is where you are learning from data without explicitly programming. And all of us as programmers have, have been through our infinite number of you know, if-thens and variations of that, trying to accommodate all the things that we have to do in our programs. And, and this takes a different approach. This is where if you have a whole lot of data, you can, you can take an approach where you give this to your program and it sorts it out by itself and it learns on its own. You're not teaching it explicitly. You're giving it a method to learn with. So deep learning is the modern application of deep neural networks to achieve machine learning. It's not the only form, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it is, it is, uh, it is an incredibly useful way of doing it. Obviously, we all hear about Google self-driving cars and now other companies self-driving cars that are out there, and you cannot possibly uh, go very far without hearing about chatbots these days. It's one of the biggest topics these days. I, I've talked to companies all the time that want to do chatbots. Um, and the thing behind the, the user interface is deep learning as well, that's figuring out what it is that you're saying to that system um, or what you're typing into the system and how it's going to respond and get context and everything. So these are some of the other use cases that are, that are really common and there's a big list and you know, highlights are basically security and um, the marketing world on the second line, different types of computer vision and recognition, speech recognition and understanding uh, different languages, obviously transportation we hit, healthcare and financial. And these, this is just the tip of the iceberg. In, in the last year, as I've really kind of divert, I've kind of made a major career change really specializing in this area instead of being kind of a generalized software engineer, and I have conversations with companies all the time. And I, I don't think there is any industry on the planet that will not eventually be touched by this technology. There, there are applications everywhere for this as it comes into being. So, this is talking about kind of how it fits in, nice and simple. You know, AI, I would even go so far as to say AI and machine learning have almost become the same thing in people's, there really isn't a meaningful AI, and there are probably someone who, who argues this, but I would say there's not a substantial body of AI outside of the machine learning world. Um, there is a substantial body of machine learning, but within that body, deep learning is the thing that's made this take off in a, in a huge way. And when people are talking in, uh, in the popular media these days about AI, machine learning, deep learning, they're really all talking about the same set of technologies. It's just different levels of specialization of the labeling that you're applying. And so if you put it in a, a little bit broader space, and this is that same circle here, and then we have kind of big data, deep learning kind of sits right there at the middle of it. Uh, deep learning, as we'll learn in a few minutes, only exists because of the amount of data that's available right now, and it would not be where it is now if we did not have that in place. So data science and big data are, are tightly integrated into deep learning being a, a functional science unto itself. Um, so it's really this juxtaposition of where all these things come together where it lives. And this gives just kind of a timeline. It, it's, to some degree, the boxes say the same thing as you saw on the other screen, and it kind of gives you a sense of where things were. You know, I was hitting it back here, and, and really deep learning in the form of neural networks really do extend back here a little ways. Um, so this, you'll see this reference in a number of my slides, and this is from the definitive uh, uh, postgraduate textbook on deep learning. So if you're in the deep learning field, you have that textbook. It is, it is really the only, it, it is kind of the Bible of the field, if you, if you will. So in recent years, deep learning has seen tremendous growth in its popularity and usefulness, due in large part, and this is important, to more powerful computers, larger data sets, and techniques to train deeper networks. And I've talked about larger data sets already. Um, the advent of cloud computing, obviously, and the various platforms that are out there are really critical to the fact that this is happening now. When it says powerful computers, it's talking about Azure and AWS and Google's uh, cloud platform. Uh, if, if those were not there for today, and that's not to say that it will stay this way going forward, there's a lot of talk about going back to the edge. But it's, it's the juxtaposition of all these things that have allowed this to happen. And if any one of those was not present today, deep learning would not be something we're talking about at all. So why does this matter? Deep neural networks can precisely approximate any continuous function. That's a really kind of a boring statement to say right there. But I would argue that when you can say, if input, then output, a function, I have stuff going in, 
some stuff happens, some stuff comes out, and it's useful, and we're being productive. That in considering the fact that just about any process imaginable in life, I'm not just talking about computing, I'm talking about as we go through our daily lives, and there are real things that we're trying to accomplish. You know, if I want a cup of coffee in the morning, and I have water, and I have the coffee machine, and I have the coffee grounds, and out comes my cup of coffee there, and, and things happen. And uh, that's an incredibly simple you know, function that we're talking about, and it doesn't need deep learning, obviously. But there are many things in life that do, and if any process imaginable involves computing a function, then, it, then that means that when I'm trying to solve real-life problems, and they're hard, this is something I might want to consider. This is huge. Neural networks are universal because they can approximate any continuous function. Um, they, they, they may not get it exact, but they typically can get it after sufficient training and when you find the right architectures and the right algorithms, they can get so close as to make it a negligible error. So what I'm really saying here is the reason you should care about deep learning is that it is a universal approach to solving complex problems. It is more versatile than nearly any other thing you could possibly come up with, and I can't come up with a single other thing that is as versatile for solving complex problems that exist in today's world. So that's cool, Chris, but I'm a gopher, not a data scientist, so why should I care about deep learning? So, several things. Deep learning is just entering another huge metamorphosis, and this, is, this, this evolution process is going so fast. It's, it's after being a software engineer for the last couple of decades, I've never seen anything moving as fast as what I'm seeing with this technology. So we probably know this guy. Um, he is Google's CEO, and something that he's been saying now for the last year and a half is that he likes to talk about the last decade being about mobile first, and you know we're all trying to get our, you know, a, you know, we're not using desktops hardly at all anymore, except for specialized cases. Even laptops are going away. We all have our mobile phones. We've all been using them through the conference nonstop, including me. And but that's the thing of the past. This is this is old news. This is where things are going. Is that now that we are uh, figured out how to use different types of edge devices, we're trying to make those devices smart, and so. In an AI-first world, he's talking about, and so are so many other CEOs, about going through their entire product and service line and, and where it makes sense applying AI capabilities into these. And in most of these cases, what they're talking about is deep learning. So artificial intelligence and machine learning are no longer just for data scientists. Putting artificial intelligence into production requires gophers. So one of, the, one of the, the things I like to note here is that one of the processes going into the AI world right now is it is being democratized in terms of its availability, and the cost to get in to AI has plunged. So three years ago, it was still quite expensive to get into AI, and, and you, had to have, you had to get data scientists on your team that had highly specialized knowledge, were good at Python, um, understood the domain set, and that presented a barrier to entry to get into this space. Well, now that uh, the, what really changed wasn't so much a technical thing, but a marketing thing. When TensorFlow, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, was open sourced, that made big news because it was Google's and it was already you know, battle tested you know, through their services. So suddenly you have this amazing package. Um, it's not necessarily better or worse than other competing packages out there, but it caught, the, it caught the world's attention when it went out there. And that started the first phase, but as we go through now, um, this is speeding up and it's going faster and it is now any one of us can go and sit down at our laptop now and over the next you know, hours, days, or weeks turn out some deep learning models that we can use in real life to solve hard, hard problems. This is something that is not, it's not beyond any of our reach at this point in time. And so in the years to come, you, all of you as programmers and developers will certainly consume and you will probably create AI and machine learning microservices. That will just be as normal as making a UI, as doing anything else that you possibly do. It's just another service out there, and you're using it many times a day over and over again. So when you think about it, most companies don't have big data science teams inside, and yet the majority of the companies in the world are small companies, mid-sized companies. It's not going to be every startup's data science team that does this stuff. What they, they don't have 
tons of data scientists. What they have is they're hiring developers. They have their development team, and, and just like they do now, they're doing DevOps, they're doing the coding, they're doing the websites, they're doing everything, and they're gonna be doing deep learning going forward. And you'll have tool sets that you reach into and use to get the job done for those small companies. And so it is very probable that even if you never really thought of yourself in that role, you're probably gonna land in it sooner than you think. This is another CIO, and he makes a point. It's, it's less about the man, uh, and it's less about even the exact timeline, but he, he's, he's noting something that's really important here. He said this, I think, about a year and a half ago. He said, you know, it's basically too early, you know, if you were looking in the past to get into it, and three years from now it'll be too late because you're never gonna catch up. And so we're, he talked about a three-year timeline here, and we're basically halfway through that. Now, I don't know if his timeline is right on, but I do know that his point is really important and that it is time to start thinking about it. The cost has come down. It's been democratized. There's lots of tools out there. This is the time to start jumping into it if this is something that you want to be into. And a lot of us may get pushed into it whether we like it or not, like I was saying before. So let's go a little deeper. What is machine learning the mad scientist answer? Kind of the real answer. Um, so we'll start with this. Deep learning is a particular type of machine learning that achieves great power and flexibility by learning to represent the world as a nested hierarchy of concepts, with each concept defined in relation to simpler concepts and more abstract representations computed in terms of less abstract ones. <laughs> got it? We got it, no problem. I can stop now. Um, this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's try again. Uh, allow computers to learn from experience and understand the world in terms of a hierarchy of concepts with each concept defined in its relation to simpler concepts. By gathering knowledge from experience, this approach avoids the need for human operators to formally specify all the knowledge that the computer needs. And the hierarchy of concepts enables the computer to learn complicated concepts by building them out of simpler ones. If we draw a graph showing how these concepts are built on top of each other, the graph is deep with many layers. Again, a very, very precise definition. So I'm betting that those last two slides did not make a huge dent in your understanding of how this works. So we'll try just once more, promise. Deep learning is an approach to machine learning that is drawn heavily on our knowledge of the human brain, statistics, and applied math. Not bad. Deep learning is an approach to AI, specifically a type of machine learning, a technique that allows computer systems to improve with experience and data. In recent years, deep learning has seen tremendous growth in its popularity and usefulness, due in large part to more powerful computers, larger data sets, and techniques to train deeper networks, which is what you heard a few minutes before, and that's really important. So uh, I put this up because this is really, these guys set what is the worldview on deep learning, and so putting a few textbook definitions and making them a little bit more accessible as we go was important. But let's delve into how it works, aside from the, the precise definition. So, as we've alluded to, there's a lot of data involved. And you can't really do deep learning without a lot of data. Um, a very, very, very small data set that's more of a toy than anything might have tens of thousands of records that you're training off of. Uh, as you start moving up and kind of getting a little bit real, you're moving into hundreds of thousands. And quite honestly, all the serious work out there, when they're doing training, they're using millions of records. So you gotta have a lot of information flowing. And this is starting to happen in this world. As we go into Internet of Things, and we have data flows, and we're just storing everything that could possibly happen out on edge devices, we, we suddenly have a wealth of data, and, uh, and after it can be engineered by a data engineer to prep it for this kind of work, um, we're starting to have the raw materials that we need to actually move things forward. So what training does is it enables generalized predictions using known correct results. And what that means is known correct results means I have a data set of labeled data that is designed to train a network for a very specific purpose. So I get a specific business problem that I want to solve, and I say, okay, what are the things that go into that? I'm gonna go out and get data from my, my uh, data lakes that is specific to that problem, or I believe it to be at least, and I'm going to have to go through, and this is the pain part right now, you have to label that data so that you know what's right and wrong, and there's a lot of work to that. And, and that's changing over time. There's, there's new technology that's coming about to change that. But right now, that's where the most pain is in deep learning. And then generalized predictions. That means your output, when I say that, means that 
if I take 10 million records and I'm going to train this network to get the right output after going through all these records, then what happens when I get a completely different record? Based on its experience, it's going to go back, and even though it's never seen those inputs specifically and exactly before, it's going to be able to give you the right answer. It figures it out, even though it's not something that's ever done. It's not memorization. The computer system is not memorizing the right answer. There is nothing in its system or a database that it references, if this, then that. It sees something new, and because the training was specific to that problem, it figures it out. So that's, as I mentioned before, a lot of known correct results. Once, tr uh, once trained, you're able to make those predictions with completely new inputs. So I want to talk a little bit about, I won't spend too much time in the guts, but I want to give you a sense of what uh, one type of basic uh, neural network and how it works, what it is. This is really the granddaddy of all of them. It's called backpropagation. It's, it, it's a, it, that is the method of training. It is applied to what's called a feed-forward network. <clears throat> and the, the basic idea here is that I have these layers. This is my input layer, and I have data that flows into that. And then I have layer, 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 layer with an output. And the jargon on this is that's called an output layer. That's the input layer. And I have three hidden layers. To qualify as a deep neural network, a neural network has to have more than one hidden layer. If, if you just have one hidden layer, which incidentally, one hidden layer will allow you to approximate any continuous function there is out there. But it may take a long time and a lot of effort to achieve that, but it is mathematically possible. Deep learning, uh, these days in real life, deep networks may have 10,000 hidden layers in them, and there could be thousands of nodes on a per layer basis. And these are all operating concurrently, as we'll talk about in just a minute. So it's, it's quite computation intensive. Thus the need for the, the cloud computing that we were talking about. So what happens here is that I have, you know, let's pretend I have a, a flow here with a bunch of iterations of records that are about to flow through it. And I steps up with my first, you know, array, or, or more precisely, it would be a tensor, you know, where you're talking multi-dimensional uh, multi data that's available to go through this. But for simplicity's sake on the explanation, imagine I have an array of data and they each line up to your input nodes. So they go in, and at this point, each one of these nodes is connected, both front and back, we'll actually start from this, to all the previous nodes in the layer before it and all the nodes in the next layer. They're not connected on the same layer. So they feed forward through there, thus the arrow is going that way. And what they do, and I'll talk about it on a per node basis shortly, but they flow through, there's some operations that happen, they flow through, operations flow through, and they get to an output. So that output that you arrive at is going to have an answer. But on that first iteration out of the 10 million that we're talking about doing, it's probably not the right answer. Um, it would almost certainly not be the right answer. There's, so there is an error between what you expected to get, um, and when I say expected, meaning remember that you have training data here that is labeled. You know for that iteration what the right answer is. You have the right answer for training purposes. So you're trying to get this actual output to match your expected output. And so, uh, and before we actually go into the next thing, I want to talk about what each one, I'm going to go back for a second. I'm going to zero in on what one of these is real quick, just so you have a sense of what we're actually doing there. This is the inside of that neuron that we're talking about. And so you're going to have it to where this is the, uh, one of the inputs coming in <clears throat> from an exterior node before it. It comes in and it's weighted. The W stands for weight, so I have weight one, two, three, and four right there. And every connection has, starts off with just a uh, randomized default weight. It doesn't matter what the number is for the first iteration. They get summed up in the transfer function, and then they pass it through what's called an activation function. And that's where the nonlinearity comes in. The activation function, and there's a whole bunch of different things out there. Uh, in the examples here, we're talking about a sigmoid function, which most of us have had in school. Um, but there's, there's a whole toolkit of different types of things you could have. And that activations function is to decide on the, whether the output should be up or down for that node. Is it good? Do I use it? Or is it bad? It's not saying is it exact. It's just saying is it, is it close enough to suit my need as one node in the larger network. And so the activation function kind of gives it life or doesn't based on here, and then that would flow into the next one. So these 
these summations and activations are happening in every node in your network. And if you're talking about thousands per layer, and you might have 10,000 layers, that's a lot of calculation happening, and it's a lot of calculation happening concurrently. So when I get to the expected output versus the actual output, I have to figure out the error. And the way I train my network here is I, I figure out, I'm not going to get into the, the math of the error stuff, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards on that, but it, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole at this point. You can calculate the error, and then you push it back up, and you do that each time. Calculate the error, calculate the error, and figure out how to adjust your weights. And so all these connections going back through all the way to the beginning are all tweaked, all the weights. And then the next time, I'll pop it back to, to the previous, you start for iteration two, and as it flows through, each of these weights are different now on these arrows. And so the amount of, of you know, authority that that node is able to lend to the network changes rapidly. And, and every time you do that, it goes back and forth. So I go there, and then I go back. And I go there, and I go back. And every time, I'm figuring out how close I'm going to get to what's an acceptable level of error there. And this is the actual learning process. By going through all this data and teaching itself and adjusting the weights based on you know, how close it is to what you wanted, this is the basis of today's world of AI revolution. This is what's, what's driving it. This is not the only thing, but this basic idea of backpropagation started yielding out various architectures that are becoming really popular. So I'm giving you the simplest possible case to talk about right now. But this is where it all originated from, and this was around 25 years ago when I was first starting to do it at the, at the dinner table talking to dad. So, uh, and this is what you get at the end. So this is like a train network. I've gone through, I've gotten to where I want it to be, and the, the widths of the arrows are kind of representing you know, how much that lends into it. And so once I have a train network, I stopped training this because I got down to where the actual and my expected were close enough to where it was, in, it was within what's acceptable to, my, to myself in terms of solving my problem. If it's a, a life and death type thing, it might be a very small error. But for many things, you don't have to have perfection to get there. You just need to be close. And so maybe I, I was able to do it because it was a, I don't know, a remote control car and it was having to, to do some calculations as it went or something toy. It doesn't matter that much. But once I have this, that goes out and becomes a microservice. We'll address that later a little bit. But that, that's no longer needs training. That is a piece of software in, out, doesn't, it just does the calculations one time and you get a good output. That's a, that's, that is AI ready for production. So you're updating each of the weights in the network so that they cause the actual output to be closer to the target output and you're minimizing the error each one along the way. And that does it and as they flow back through it does it for the network as a whole. So training is essentially a search. You're searching for the set of weights within a given architecture that allow you to get to the lowest global error for the training set. And when you, when you get within that, that uh, area that's acceptable for your use case, you're there. You're done. So we just talked about the back propagation, which is the top. It was kind of the granddaddy of them all. And I wanted to take just a moment and nod towards some of the others, because you're hearing about these all the time, uh, whether you realize it or not. Uh, convolutional networks are all the things, so Google Cars and all the things that are doing visual identification and anything that has to do with object identification uh, is that. And what basically this has done is it's taken a back propagation network up there and they've added a couple of other components in here that are specialized um, on visual and really grid-oriented grid problems. Uh, when you're looking at a, a visual picture, a bunch of pixels, there's a relationship between a pixel and the pixels right around it because in, you, know, you have the visual gradients that go off. And so there's some tools that this introduces and it allows that stuff to work. Recurrent right here allow the sense of time back into the network because in addition to connecting, they have loopbacks where it'll actually take data and look at it in a temporal sense by looping it all the way back through um, and making other adjustments to it. And then this is the hottest, coolest thing right now in AI. Um, and I kind of threw it in just to tell you. So one of the big problems I alluded to was training data. Um, and with training data, you're having to label. You might spend months labeling your training set before you ever actually get started on the AI stuff. This thing here is saying, I could take a small training data, and I'm going to have two neural networks that fight it out with a zero-sum game. And so one of them, all it does is analyze training data coming in, and it has to discriminate whether it's real or not real. And, it, and, and if it's real data, it uses it for training. If it decides it's not real, it pushes it back. 
and it, it fights against a generative neural network, and all its purpose is is to take the training data and make it look real. If it's not real enough, it takes the output, and they fight about each other, and what it does is it actually enlarges your training data set. So you can start with a data set that's like this, which maybe is that 10,000 records I talked about, and you need it to go to 10 million. So you can use this technology to actually create, going back to uh, Mr. Trump's comment about fake AI, you kind of create fake data that's, re that's it's fake, but it's good enough to be real for your training purposes, and therefore you get a massive data set to train off of. So you're almost generating almost real data as you go. And that's how, that's kind of the, the leading way of solving this problem. It's still very early days for this, but it's a really cool technology because it might mean I don't have to spend six months getting training data ready in the future to solve a problem. I can keep solving problems at a much rapid pace. So right now, I want to throw in, I'm uh, alluding to the Go tool, Go reality check on this. So. Despite the fact that we've established that it is a dominant computer trend, computing trend, you know, potentially for the next decade, we gophers are being left behind in this AI revolution. And so, you know, I, I, I'm kind of transitioning a little bit right now. I kind of wanted to bring you into what this technology is at a basic level, and then I wanted to talk about the fact that we're not really participating in this the way I think we should. Um, I think we've all seen, you know, the, the stats. Last year we were the 55th you know, most popular language, and I think we're up to 10 in the last Taobi index. And yet, even though we are surging forward as this amazing community that's enlarging, we haven't, we're not really playing in this space yet. So this is what it looks like if you're a gopher in the middle, and you have Pythons and C++ all over the place. And, and, and as a gopher, you're, you're a little bit left out in the cold in this space. Um, this is really real to me, because I was not a Python programmer uh, at all, really, uh, before very recently. And the only reason I'm at all a Python programmer today is because I can't do it in Go. I can't do all of it in Go. I can't do it at the level to be a professional in Go right now. Um, I can go write custom neural networks, and we'll talk about that, and that's an option. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of others going forward here. But this is where we're starting from right now. So I'm saying pretend that the Cobra is a Python. I know it's not a Python. But that's us today, as we sit here in the, in the face of the AI revolution. And um, it's a bit of a tragedy when you think about the, the, what we all in this room know so well about this language that we love. You know, it's, the performance is amazing, it's so simple to use, it has all these qualities that, you know, from other languages that we can go, ha ha, we're statically, but yet we still have all this capability you know, that the dynamic languages have always claimed. It's just a wonderful language, and by the way, Concurrency is first class in every way, and for neural networks, boy howdy, do you need that. But that's where we're at right now. We haven't really jumped in. So these are debatably the top deep learning frameworks out there. Some of them are not just deep learning, they're, they're larger machine learning uh, with a big deep learning uh, focus in them. But this is kind of, if you're in this space, in the AI space, these are the packages that people talk about and care about for large scale implementation. And so, of all those, the only one that has any support at all at this point in time for Go is TensorFlow. So, uh, there are other options where you can, you know, as we've done in other areas outside of AI, wrap other languages and stuff like that, and that's possible, and, and you might get great results from that. Um, but one of the things that I point out is I love Go. <laughs> I want to do it in Go. And, and even if I can go into other languages and do it in Python or wrap Python or whatever else, I want to do it in Go just because that's what I want to live in. And so right now, TensorFlow has some support, um, and it is the market leader really not so much from necessarily being the best. I love TensorFlow, I'm not, I'm not doubting it, but there's several that are really, really good out there, but it was from Google and that makes a huge difference. Um, and so I'm glad that if there's only one of those group, it is TensorFlow, because it's a lot easier to go into the boardroom at a company and sell TensorFlow than something that they may not be familiar with, or maybe the only, only the academic world is familiar with. Um, and so I threw in, this is kind of, what you can do with TensorFlow here is they're basically, you'll see the comment, which is a quote from the docs, by the way. Um, they're basically saying, go out, do all your training in Python, and then after you have a trained network, we're gonna give you the ability to create the graph with the primitives you need to use a trained network in production. So we can use it, 
if it's trained. But I, I will say, as someone in this space, I want to do the training. The training is where all the meat of it is. I want to do the training and go as well. So, and this is another option right here uh, that I wanted to throw out. Uh, if you want, uh, I picked this one to show because uh, it has more stars on GitHub than any of the other frameworks. There's, there's quite a few out there you know, where people have experimented and tried stuff. Um, I'm not necessarily saying this is the best or anything, but it's the one that has the most mind share right now. Um, and the gentleman who is the author is from London, and I checked yesterday to see if he was here today, because you know, he, he lives in town, but apparently he's not at the conference to the best of my ability to tell. Um, but if you have an interest in this, go in, go to the neural uh, section, and if you go through here, the things that I was talking about, about the, the neurons and the activation functions, you'll see all of that in his source. The, the, all that is there, you'll see it applied as Go. Now, every Go library I see that applies itself to neural tackles it a little bit differently. So you won't see the same exact implementation every time, but you'll see the general ideas implemented each way. And, and it's, we don't have time for today, but it will, if you have an interest, I encourage you to go there and see what it looks like to do. It's not actually that hard. There's not nearly as much code as you might expect. And also, we have the gentleman here who did Machine Box. And you may have heard that recently in the last few months. It's been in, uh, coming out in all the various uh, Go-specific news outlets. Uh, machine Box is uh, an excellent machine learning framework. Uh, it's free for developers. There's a Go SDK, um, and it gives you models that are ready to use. And so I very much am hoping that this takes off within our community. Uh, is one of the, the go-to things. Um, so there's almost two levels. I want everyone to try deep learning and go, and I also want to get the big frameworks that have the mind share in, in, in large businesses to also cater to it. So the future of deep learning and the role of go in its ecosystem. And, and in general, and this is the last quote from the book, I promise, the years ahead are full of challenges and opportunities to improve deep learning even further and bring it to new frontiers. Well, I want the Go programming language to be one of those new frontiers. When I, every time I see that statement, that's what it means to me. So this is a call to action to all of you in this room and to anybody who might be watching this on YouTube later on. Right now, status quo, we're not going to really have a big role in the larger frameworks that the larger companies are implementing unless we go out there and claim that proactively. So we need to have fully functional native Go APIs that start getting built into all these networks so that we can actually do this without running to C++ or running to Python to get it done and then coming back to Go after it's done. Um, and we need to go. And I would say we already have, you know, Google is obviously where Go came from. TensorFlow already has partial support for it. And so I reached out yesterday, and you don't need to read all this, but I literally got this late yesterday um, from the TensorFlow core team. I said, I'm in London. I'm about to talk about TensorFlow tomorrow. Um, we have people who really want to use TensorFlow beyond the ways that it can be done now. And the short of this is, and you can read it in the deck later, is you know, he notes what they have, um, and, and he also talks about some big ticket missing items. And by the way, he knew that I was going to share this with everyone, so it wasn't like I took a private email and stuck it out there. Um, but he's basically saying, you can do this, and we, the TensorFlow team, are willing to help you get there. We don't have the capability of taking it on ourselves. It's, it's, it's one of those things they just don't have the bandwidth. But if the Go community has an interest in deep learning, and they want to make this work for TensorFlow in a more comprehensive way, They'll help us get there. And that's my mission today, is to start recruiting those of you who might, who might have an interest in this. And let's go do this. So this is what I think deep learning is going toward. Um, I'm very much hoping that Go becomes a major language in deep learning in the years to come, if we can go out and grab that. Um, you may, all these are obviously Go, you know, uh, Go packages and Go software um, that we already are using and we're loving. Yeah, I'm sure you know Docker and uh, Kubernetes. I hope you have heard about Pachyderm over the past year, which is a data lake written in Go uh, by Dan uh, Daniel Whitenack as part of the organization that does that. Uh, so you guys probably know him from the data science presentations at GopherCon. Um, and this is, I really think, it, it, you know, other than it being deep learning, it fits into what we're already doing. This is normal stuff for us. In the years ahead, this will continue to be normal stuff. So there's hope for, there's also hope for Go in the, uh, in the hype cycle of deep learning. So we all see these hype cycles that Gardner puts out. 
Well, this just came out last month. So right now, deep learning, there's good and bad news to this. Deep learning has been this hot topic. It's right at the very top of the cycle. So over the next year, uh, Gardner's saying, oh, we're going to plunge. Everyone's going to be, oh, that deep learning stuff, it's terrible, doesn't work, and, and move away. Well, I'm going to make an argument. We've already been left out of, the, uh, out of this particular playground. So I actually am kind of glad that we're about to take a plunge before it actually really happens. Because they're also noting it will get picked up by everybody, ultimately. So let's take the downfall right there and go build the Go tools for this so that when we get to the bottom and we start the long-term trend up, that we're players in the space. So while everybody else is frustrated, let's go build. It's a great opportunity right now. So that's, that's what I'm encouraging. That's what I'm hoping that folks will do. And that's it. I wanted to give a special thank you to Daniel Whitenack uh, of, of Go Data Science fame because uh, he did a lot of mentoring with me in previous months, including helping me get uh, my proposal in. And he's just a great leader in the larger data science world for, for the Gopher community. So I wanted to say thank you and feel free to connect. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Hi. Very good presentation. Uh, Thank you. You talked a bit about how you need a lot of data to do a lot of deep learning, and mm -hmm. you talked a bit about generative uh, data stuff as well, which might come at that kind of thing. But uh, from what I understand, it becomes much easier if you have a lot of data. So how do we prevent large companies that have access to large data uh, from stealing all of this innovation, but essentially uh, that's not possible for smaller companies or individuals to do? Uh, so, a, a couple of thoughts on that. I actually, I, I'm, I'm going to challenge the premise in part. So, we do have the, the there's, there's both the kind of the regulation of the data, because there's a lot, of, obviously, you know, we talk about privacy issues and we talk about uh, security issues around data. Um, but the challenge, that, uh, the thing I'm going to challenge you on is the idea that the big companies only can do that and the small companies, we're going forward. If, set aside AI for a moment. Let's talk about Internet of Things. The, the multiplication or exponentially of edge devices is going to just fly through the roof at this point. Um, and I went through a whole interview process a few months ago and I talked to several companies about deep learning but they were also intimately tied into IoT. And, and in, in each case, these, they're major global companies that you've heard of. And the plans that each one were telling me as a candidate about what they were going to do, I mean, it's just the amount of data being collected out there is just phenomenal going forward. The big companies can do it. Startups, I, there's, a, there's a healthy startup community in Atlanta that I participate in. And it, within that community, we'll have companies that are, you know, four people, five people, and they have huge amounts of data coming in and being stored, uh, like an AWS Redshift or S3, for instance. That's a really common approach. Just massive amounts of data for a five-person company. I think it's so cheap now to just collect everything, and you have you know, analytics applied to all of your software out there, whether it's AI-specific or not, that I think this capability is going to go forward. It may be that if you're a small company starting up, you might have to run for a little bit of time to generate that data. But I don't, think it's, I don't think it's specific to large companies in the future. I think that it's going to be something we can all do. Any other questions? Uh, you you want to go first and then Eva? Yeah, hi. So hey you mentioned um, some things are missing for TensorFlow. Do you think there are other tools around in the language that are missing for uh, go to be a viable choice, something like the notebook in Python or something like that? I, that that's great. Not only that, but Daniel has, you know, has a Go version. You can do Go code in, uh, in Jupyter Notebooks, if that's what you're referring to. And so that's a great tool. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of tools that we need to do. We can wrap things today. Um, and, and that's a perfectly valid way to start. I, I would like to see, but you're, when you're wrapping something, you're still, you know, you're, you're not on the inside. I still want to see us as a community rise up, say, we have the perfect language for this. You know, maybe there are other really good languages, but we're as good, if not better, than all the others out there for this kind of application. And we need to fight for our, our way in to have a, a seat at the table, at the big boys table, if you will. And so, yeah, there's a lot of tools that I think we need to create. And all those frameworks that got grayed out, 
when we were talking our way through there. I think that there, there's opportunities. A lot of those have C++ at the core currently, and they might be wrapped by Python. And so that, you know, that's their way of saying, well, that way we get the performance at the core for the calculation, but Python for accessibility. Well, you know, a good start on there is let's do APIs in Go that then you know, use Go and go in. And that's, that's a start. You know, I know that Go is not the most popular thing, but if it gets me in the door, then I'll take it. And then we can talk about the core later on. And you, sir. So um, question about the, uh, how the neural networks are trained and then used, really. Um, my, my, I'm showing my ignorance here because because I've done very little neural networks some some time ago. Um, I'm kind of puzzled that you say that the neural network can approximate a continuous function, mm -hmm. and we do all this training work, which is computationally hard. Correct. With data that's difficult to assemble, uh, but we get to a really good place at the end of that, which is that we now know when we feed in uh, unfamiliar data, we can be pretty sure that we can categorize it correctly on the output. Yeah. So we've determined the continuous function that does that. Correct. It still has to be specific to the function that we've gone and find. What, yeah. When you're training the neural network, you're basically saying, there's a function out there, and yeah. today I do not know what that function is. Right, so that was my question really, which is, can I then interrogate the, the trains network and then produce a correlator or something that is a, that is a simpler implementation of the same function? So there is research in that area that's going on as we speak, but as the, the answer today is you can't interrogate. So a neural network between that input layer and the output layer is a black box. You, right. So you can go in and you can say, you know, I, you know, I know it all for any given layer, I know what the activation functions, I know what other, any other functions I've added in are, um, and I know what the weights are based on the architecture that I've put in place, but you can't look at any of those things in isolation and say this has context, it has meaning. Yeah. It, it is literally the aggregation of all those many thousands or millions of connections together that form it. And, and, and that way, that's where that, that kind of um, attribution to the human brain comes in, or, or any, you know, any mammalian, mammalian brain, in, in the sense of you, you, know, you can't go and say this is the neuron in my brain that has that information I'm seeking. It's spread over a network in sure. the brain, yeah. and it's the same thing here. It is that black box in if, that if, way. if you could read out that function, then you could implement in, within embedded devices like mobiles or whatever, the, the capability to process, process that data much more cheaply. So there's already, that's where things are going. And so this is one of those things um, that I didn't put in this because it's not consensus in the community yet. <clears throat> but there, is, there are people in Silicon Valley in California today that are, that are trying to address edge devices in an IoT world. And right now, <clears throat> there is actually a sentiment that it won't be very cloud specific for long. You'll start having distributed training between edge devices and cloud, and ultimately it may be that more and more of that is happening on edge devices, and then it kind of gets pushed up to the cloud you know, to, to save it in the long run. But just as we've seen in larger computing where things go from a centralized model to a distributed model and back again as new technologies come out, this deep learning world is also doing that. Right now, we are in this centralized model where we're using cloud resources, because that's the only place we can get what we need. But in the near future, near future, we're actually gonna be pushing that out to edge devices and you'll have distributed training. And there's been some work by NVIDIA where they've already done some successful tests where instead of it being on one computer and they're running the network over it, they're distributing it, uh, the entire training process across, I think it was 64 servers uh, that they had where it's no longer just distributing among GPU cores but actually distributing among completely separate machines. And to the to my knowledge, that was the first time that it happened. So uh, this is racing. I mean, if I were to come up here three months from now, I'd have a very different story in a lot of these areas. It's going that fast. Um, one two-second follow-up is it's moving so fast right now that once upon a time in data science, you know, you'd, there'd be a conference like this you know, for data science, and you come up and you present your paper on it, and that's kind of how your peers get to review it and hear it for the first time. It doesn't happen that way in deep learning anymore because it's happening so fast that they just put it out on the Internet in one of several different venues, and five days later, you know, Google may do something here, and then Microsoft takes it to the next level five days later, and two weeks after that, Amazon comes out and says, this is what we did. It's moving that fast. It's just phenomenal. Any other questions? 
Okay, feel free to talk to me afterwards if you'd like or at any point today through the conference. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>